Well, this morning, as you can see, we're going to continue on in um, on this idea of uh, when the Holy Spirit was going to be given. Um, he was going to to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. Remember last time when we gathered together and I was preaching, uh, we covered the idea of sin. Um, we looked at the many wonders in the universe. You know the um, the sun, the moon, the stars, the earth, the hydrological system, the living creatures and all that, they, um, that would produce after their kind. And we also looked into, at mankind. And we thought that, you know, if just as uh, a painting needs a painter, so to do all these things, um, creation itself needs a creator. We then had a look at sin. Um, who has sinned? Who has broken God's laws? And... Um, and we determined from that that all has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then we had a look at those that uh, believed not on me. Those who didn't believe that Jesus was the Christ. And most of the time, looking through that, we saw that it was the, right, the religious people. Um, those who had made a name for themselves through religious, um, doing religious things. But it was the lay person. It was the normal everyday person. The people that didn't... They weren't studying the, the scriptures all the time as much as these Pharisees and, and whatnot. They weren't the religious people who, who took up Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. So, John 16, 7 to 11. I'll just read it uh, quickly once again. Um, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is expedient for you that I go away. For if I go not away, the Comforter will not come unto you. But if I depart, I will send him unto you. And when he has come... He will reprove the world of sin and of righteousness and of judgment to come. Last time we did of sin because they believe not on me. Today we are looking of righteousness because I go to my Father and you see me no more. And hopefully next time, God willing, we'll do of judgment because the prince of this world is judged. So this morning we are going to look at what is righteousness. We'll then go on and have a look at, can the righteousness of the law redeem us? And then we'll also have a look at the righteousness of Christ. Always remember, as it says in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, all scripture is given by inspiration of God. It is proper for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And also in Romans 15, 4, whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for our learning, that, though, that through patience and comfort of the scriptures we might have hope. Okay, so bear these in mind as we go through uh, this, this lesson this morning. Okay, let's start off with what is righteousness? You can see there I've actually put on, um, on the screen Old Testament and New Testament. So righteousness itself appears. Um, a fair, fair bit within the, uh, the Old Testament. And you can see there's two words really that come up the most in the Old Testament. You can see that Sedokor, the first one there, um, and then there's also Sedak. Now these can be intermi intermingled with other words, and so not just the word righteous, but also words like, as you can see there, um, uh, justice is one of those words, um, moral, uh, like. Uh, just or justice, uh, anything to do with righteousness and that through the Old Testament. Uh, and in the New Testament, you have uh, <laughs> uh which means equity or justification, and also dikoma, dikayuma, uh, which is equitable, an equitable deed or justification. So you can actually see there, I've actually gone through and actually highlighted a few of the words. It's probably a little bit harder to see, but there's a word there called... Uh, in the Old Testament, under Sadak or rectitude. Um, it's not a word that really gets used uh, too much in, um, in this life. But rectitude means morally correct behaviour or thinking. Okay, So one of the examples of, of righteousness is morally correct behaviour or thinking. Another word that I've highlighted there was justice. And justice, and these words are coming from the Oxford Dictionary. Justice is the quality of being fair and reasonable. So righteousness, righteousness can be correct moral behaviour and thinking. Uh, and it can also be a quality of being fair and reasonable. 
You also see I've got virtue. Now, virtue is um, one of those things that is mentioned in the Bible, and its, it's meaning means behavior showing a high moral standard. And another word there you'll see is equity or, or ec being equitable. Equity is a quality of being fair and impartial. So from these, we can see that righteousness itself means morally correct behaviour or thinking, the quality of being fair and reasonable, <coughs> behaviour showing a high moral standard, and the quality of being fair and impartial. So sometimes to fully understand uh, a word and you know, it's, it's how it's being implied, it's sometimes to do a, a contrast. Um, have a look at the opposite of what righteousness is. Now, a good example, I think, is probably found right here on our pulpit. You'll see there, on our pulpit, it's from Proverbs 14.34. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So this scripture is contrasting two sides. Righteousness, which exalts a nation. Exalt is to raise higher in rank or position, to make noble in character. And sin, which is a reproach to people. So righteousness, well, what we can say here then, if that is the case, if righteousness exalts a nation, then moral correct behaviour, quality of being fair and reasonable, showing high moral standards, and being fair and equitable, exalts and raises up to a noble, uh, to a noble, to make noble in character, a nation. So the righteousness you would see from this scripture that is obviously a positive thing and something that can help any nation if the people within that, especially the people who are in power, are holding to this idea of righteousness, as opposed to sin, which obviously shows that if people within a nation, especially those people in power, are sinful and not holding to a moral law, can actually make a nation become depraved and a lot worse off. So... If we want to learn how to do what is righteous according to Him who made us, we according to God, we will need to have a standard of righteousness. Just as we need road rules to determine what is the correct way to transverse the roads, we need moral road rules on how to best to transverse this life according to Him who created us. Now, we don't believe as Christians in, mo uh, in moral relativism. We don't believe that morality or things like righteousness is something that changes. We believe in moral universalism, which means no matter where you come from, this idea of righteousness is exactly the same. It doesn't depend on your culture and societal norms. Deuteronomy 4. Um, in Deuteronomy 4, if you'd like to turn there with me, Moses reminds the Israelites about the importance of keeping God's law before they go into the promised land. If you'd like to turn with me to Deuteronomy 4. You remember that we've previously, in the, the, the sermons that I've been doing, we've covered sin itself quite extensively. And we've also covered this idea of the law. But I think sometimes it's good to, to go over these, um, these scriptures as well. So Deuteronomy 4, 5 says, Behold, I've taught you statutes and judgments. Okay, so here... Moses is saying, we have given you uh, the moral, the, uh, the, the idea of where your morality comes from, the righteousness in which it comes from. It's the, moral, the, the statutes and, uh, and judgments. Even as the Lord my God commanded me. So Moses is saying here, it's not me who has brought you these things or given you these, these standards. It has come from the mouth of God. That you should do so in the land whither you go to possess it. Keep, therefore, and do them. For this is your wisdom and your understanding in the sight of the nations, which shall hear all these statutes and say, Surely this great nation is a wise and understanding people. So, holding on to these statutes and judgments that God has given these, the nations around them would see as they go into this promised land that these people have a different way about them. They have a different standard in which they live their life. And the nations would have seen that. Uh, for what nation is there, verse number 7, for what nation is there so great who has God so nigh unto them as the Lord our God is in all these things that we call upon Him for? And what nation is there so great that has statutes and judgments so righteous 
as all this law which I set before you this day. Only take heed. Now here comes a warning Moses is giving to Israel. Take heed to thyself and keep thy soul diligently. Lest thou forget the things which thine ears have seen, the eyes have seen, sorry, and lest they depart from thy heart all the days of thy life. But teach them to thy sons and thy sons' sons. Especially the day that thou stoodst before the Lord thy God in horror, when the Lord said unto me, Gather me to the people together, and I will make them hear my words. That they may learn to fear me all the days that they shall live upon the earth, and that they may teach their children. So we have here God's moral statutes and laws. All the people of Israel would have heard these mighty and righteous moral laws. They come from the mouth of God, not from the mouth of Moses. And all the people who were there before Horeb had heard that. You know, when uh, the voice came down upon the mountain and it was on fire and they, all the people could have seen that. So there we have the idea of a righteous and moral law. Something that we can see that comes from God that will make us righteous and so that the people around us can see they sound that, 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 that the Israelites specifically were, were different. So, I ask you the question, can people be righteous and not keep the law fully? Can people still be righteous but not keep kept the law fully? Well, let's have a look at a couple examples of people who were called righteous under the Old Testament law. Turn with me to Matthew verses 1. <clears throat> We're going to have a look at uh, Joseph, Jesus' um, earthly dad, so to speak, although he didn't partake in uh, the conception. Um, the Bible actually says in Matthew that he himself was a righteous person. Matthew 1 verses 18 says, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. Now, in those days, Joseph, Joseph we know from the scriptures, was a carpenter. Um, and in, in the towns and such like that, pretty much everybody went to the synagogue. And if you were to be found in a relationship that... Um, that was contrary to the, the laws and the statutes in those times. You could be excommunicated from the synagogue. That doesn't mean that you were just excommunicated from that synagogue, but you were ex pretty much excommunicated from that whole town. You could no longer do work. Joseph could no longer be a carpenter in that town because of people would be seeing him as, as, as breaking God's law. And so he didn't want that to happen to himself, and he wanted to make sure he was still looking after... Um, after Mary as well, so um, he tried to do it secretly to break off that whole thing secretly, so that those implications weren't, weren't happening so much to them. Verse number twenty says, "But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. The child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit." So Joseph himself, as the Scripture says, and the Scripture is. Good for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, instruction. Says that Joseph himself was a righteous man. All right, so Joseph was righteous. Let's have a look at another example of somebody being called righteousness, righteous under the Old Testament law. Let's turn to Mark now, Mark six, verse eighteen. And here we're going to have a look at um, definitely a righteous person. Um, I'm going to have a look at John the Baptist. Now, John the Baptist was before uh, Herod, and he pretty much told Herod that what he was doing was wrong. And let's have a look at this in Mark, Mark chapter 6. For John had been saying to Herod, It is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to put him to death, put John to death, and could not do so. For Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man. And he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was very perplexed. So Herod himself was perplexed by the things which John was saying. He couldn't deny that what John was saying was righteous, was right. But, um, and he couldn't put him to, to, to death. He was perplexed, but he used to enjoy listening to him. 
So we can see here through the scriptures that Herod saw John as a righteous person. So, Joseph was a righteous person. John was a righteous person. These guys were underneath the law. Does that make them saved though? The one thing we need to understand is that you can be righteous and you can do good works. You can do... Um, you can be fair, you can be reasonable, you can do all these things. There are a lot of people who you have conversations with, when you ask them if they're a good person, they'll say, yes, I am a good person, because I've done good things. I have out showings of good things. All people can do good. All people can do righteous things. Isaiah 64, 6 says, but we are all as an unclean thing, and all our righteousnesses are as, a filthy, as, are as filthy rags, and we all do fade as a leaf, and our inequities, like the wind, have taken us away. So, no matter how good we think we are, no matter how good anybody thinks that they are, through their righteous deeds and their righteous actions, according to the scriptures, they are like filthy rags. Why are they like filthy rags? Well, I know I've already said this probably in a previous um, sermon, and I always come back to this. I think, I think it's such a good scripture. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, Indeed, there is not a righteous man on earth who continually does good and who never sins. We have all done good deeds, every single one of us. Now, we have all done righteous deeds, and we could, some of us could be called righteous. But we have all sinned and broken those holy Judgments that we've spoken about that Moses had given down to, um, to, to the Israelites. And we have all done so. So we can see, under the old law, you can be righteous, you can be good, you can be equitable, you can be fair. But that does not mean that you are saved. So let's have a look at the righteousness of the law and whether or not it can redeem us. Because, as you can see on the screen there, 1 Timothy 1 says, We know that the law itself is good, if a man uses it lawfully. To use it lawfully is to be able to do every single thing that is found therein and not break it. So the law itself is good, as long as we use that law lawfully. Psalm 19.7 says, The law of the Lord is perfect. Perfect. Tormeim. Without blemish. It's complete. It is truth. It's sincerity. The law of the Lord is truth. Without blemish. Complete. It is perfect. Converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is pure. Making wise the simple. The law can also make somebody like myself seem wise. The law itself is perfect. The law is good if it's used lawfully. Galatians 3.21 says, Is the law then against the promises of God? Looking now to the New Testament, God forbid. For if there had been a law given, which could have given life, verily righteousness should have been by the law. I don't think it's the fact that the, the, the law itself is not deemed righteous, because we know that the law is perfect, the law is good, and the law is righteous. The fact is that no matter how righteous that law is, we as humans could never attain to it. We could never be so righteous and so good and so perfect to be able to keep the law 100%. It is not within us to do so. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is not one that does righteousness. Though we can be righteous, not even one. All our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So what we know about the law is, as you can see up on the board, is that for some people, they thought that they could be so righteous that it brought in pride. And most of the time, this was religious people. Religious people thought that they could attain to a type of righteousness that would look down on other people. Turn with me to Deuteronomy 9. I'm going to read from verses 4 to 6. Um, 
when the, pro the Israelites were going into the promised land, they were obviously going through and they were destroying a lot of nations that were mightier than, uh, than themselves. Now, they had, along the way, taken up swords and, and whatnot. They, they pretty much take, they took a lot of things from Egypt. They gave them to, they got them to themselves, gold, silver, um, cattle, all these things. God gave them these as they were coming out. And you can think that as they were going along, that maybe the reasons why all these things were happening were because of a certain righteousness that they had. Uh, Moses here in Deuteronomy puts that to bed. Deuteronomy 9 4 says, Do not say in your heart, when the Lord your God has driven them out before you, so when the people that the Israelites are going into the promised land will be driven out, because of my righteousness, the Lord has brought me into this, this land to possess this land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is disposing them before you. Not because of your own righteousness. It is not for your righteousness or for the uprightness of your heart that you are going to possess their land. But it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God is driving them out before you. In order to confirm the oath which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac... And to Jacob. Obviously, we know that um, the promise of the promised land was to Abraham when he took him up in that, 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 that mountain and said, All this that you see will be yours. That promise was to Abraham because Abraham believed God. He believed in the things of God and he obeyed. He showed obedience to God. Verse 6 Know then that it is not because of your righteousness that the Lord your God has given you this land to possess. For you are a stubborn people. So you can see that it could be that those Israelites in that time had a type of pride in their righteousness. They believed that they were doing righteous deeds and that is the reason why the Lord was doing this. But God, through Moses, has said, it's not because of your righteousness, but because of the promise that I had given to Moses. I'm keeping my promise. Even though you are a stubborn and stiff-necked people and you break my commandments all the time, I'm still bringing them in, not because of what you've done, because of my promise. Another example that we can see here is found in Luke. If you'd like to turn with me to Luke chapter 18. Uh, Jesus spoke a parable unto certain people. Um, pretty much, once again, Jesus normally, whenever he was speaking parables like this, was taking apart the religious people, taking apart the Pharisees, those people who believed that they obtained some form of righteousness of their own works. And he spake this parable, verse number 9 of chapter 18 in Luke, unto certain which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. They despised others because they believed that they weren't as righteous as they are. Two men went up to a temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus within himself, God, I thank thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. It's interesting, if you look in verse number 12 there, of what the Pharisee was saying, he's justifying himself before a holy and righteous God. He's throwing his righteousness before the God and thinking that God is going to accept those righteousness. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Thank you that I'm not like other men. He had such a pride of his righteousness, of, of, of what he has done, the works that he has done, that he looked down on people who were coming before God contritely with a humble heart, pouring out their heart to a holy and merciful God, asking for forgiveness because they understand that they are sinners and that their sin will take them to hell, will lead them to eternal separation from God their Father. Mark 12, 38 says, And he said unto them in his doctrine, Beware of the scribes which love to, uh, to go in long clothing and love salutations in the marketplace. And the chief seats in the synagogues and the uppermost rooms in the feasts, which devour widows' houses and for a pretense make long prayers, these shall receive greater damnation. <clears throat> Don't be like these religious people who have believed so much in themselves and hated anything that was actually righteous so much to the point that they crucified the Lord of glory. Let's have a look at another point. Let's have a look at what else the law brought. Well, the law brought the knowledge of sin. Turn with me to Romans 4.15. 
Can the righteousness of the law redeem us? Uh, Romans 4.15 says, Because the law works wrath, for where no law is, there is no transgression. So, for so many people, if there was no law, if there was no idea of what righteousness is from God, then there is no transgression. So we understand that, right? Romans 7 to 7 and 8 goes on to say, What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Now I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, Thou shall not covet. So here Paul is saying to the, Ro- Paul is saying to the Romans that without the law, we would not understand that there is a righteous way to live. And we would not know that we ourselves had sinned. We had to know that there was something there to hold us accountable to. But sin taking occasion by the commandment wrought in me, verse 8, all manner of concupiscence. For without the law, sin was dead. So if there was no law, there was no sin. There was nothing to attain to. There was no... Um, people could quite easily say that they were righteousness. Because what is your moral standard? What is the standard in which you are clinging to? It goes on to say in James 2, if you like to turn there with me, James 2 verses 10. This really sort of brings it home. Um, James sort of had a good understanding of the law and wanted to pronounce this to the people in which he's, he's, doing, he's coming in contact with. Um... For those people who thought that they could attain to some sort of righteousness through the law, he said for what, in verse 10, for, whatsoever shall, for whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. For he that said, do not commit adultery, said also, do not kill. Now if thou commit no adultery, yet if thou kill, thou art become a transgressor of the law. So it doesn't really matter. If you're trying to attain to this self-righteousness by keeping the law fully, or believing that you are keeping the law fully. All you had to do was commit one sin under the law and you would be found guilty in the eyes of a holy God. Just as James said, you may not kill somebody or you may not commit adultery and then kill. You only had to do was one transgression of that law and you were guilty of it. So understanding this, that you were guilty, then there must be judgment. We understand then that the next point that the law brought the knowledge of sin, and sin brought death. Tell me the Genesis 3.21. I always go back to Genesis. It's such a rich part of the scriptures. There's so much there for us to glean. Uh, Genesis 3, verses 21. After Adam and Eve sinned, after God told them not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, and they did eat, Judgment came upon them, because, as he said, you will certainly, surely die. In Genesis chapter 3, when they were handing out, after God had handed out the, um, uh, handed out the punishment, God did something to cover Adam and Eve, because Adam and Eve had made for themselves fig leaves. They didn't understand that, that they had this knowledge that they had sinned. And they made themselves a covering of fig leaves. And this is the way with all mankind. We will always try to cover our sins. Like, like with filthy rags, really. Like, like with, with, with fig leaves. God showed them that they actually had to be clothed. They had to be clothed with something that had died. Genesis 3.21 says, And Adam also unto his wife, he did, um, wife, did the Lord God make coats of skins and clothe them? So death had to happen. In order for those skins to have been made, to have, for God to have been able to cover Adam and Eve, death had to happen. And this is the point. Sin brought death, and wherever sin was, death was going to reign. We don't have to look too far, if you turn with me to Leviticus, to see that it doesn't matter whether or not it was a known sin, or it was a sin that... Um, you know, what does this? What does the scripture say? Yeah, a sin that you did in ignorance, um, if, as it says in Leviticus four, turn with, uh, to, to verses number two. 
So it's not one that, if, even if you knew the, the, that, if you didn't know the commandments, you could still sin. Leviticus 4, 2, 4 says, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a soul shall sin through ignorance against any of my commandments, the law of the Lord, concerning things which ought not to be done, and shall do against any of them, if the priest that is anointed do sin according to the sin of the people, then let him bring for his sin, which he has sinned, a young bullock without blemish unto the Lord for sin. And he shall bring the bullock unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, and shall lay his hand upon the bullock's head, and cure the bullock before the Lord. So he was killing this bullock. The bullock had to die. It had to, blood had to be spilt for the sins of the people and of, of the priests. And wherever there is sin, there is death. And this was pretty, pretty much, like there was pretty much a river of blood flowing from the tabernacle. Because every single person every year would bring a lamb, a bullock. And the whole point of this was to show people that there had to be death in the place of where their sin was. The blood had to be spilt to cover their sin. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is life eternal. The wages of sin is death. So if we've broken the law, God's righteousness, God's righteous law, we deserved death. And this is why Christ had to come. And you can see, of oh, righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. Let's finish off now looking at Christ Jesus. First and foremost, what do we understand about Jesus? Well, Jesus descended from heaven. He who was righteous, he who was there at the very beginning, came down from above, from a place where he was worshipped, a place where he was glorified, and was born as a humble baby. John 6.38 says, For I came down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. So we can see here, through the scriptures, Jesus came down not to do his own will, not to, be, to do his own bidding, but to do the bidding of his Father. He was showing that he, not only coming down to, to, to earth for mankind, but to do the righteousness of his Father. You see, Jesus himself was obedient to the things of his Father. He didn't break the things of his Father. Psalms 40, if you'd like to turn there with me. Speaking of Christ Jesus, speaking of how he honours his Father. Psalm 40, verse 6 says, Sacrifice and offering thou did not desire. Sacrifices and offerings were only ever given because of sin. Because people had sinned, sacrifices were made. Death was made because of sin. Mine ears has thou opened, burnt offerings and sin offerings thou hast not required. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book, it is written of me. I delight to do thy will. This is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. He had such a delight. To do the will of the Father. Oh my God, yea, the law is within my heart. So Jesus himself stepped down from heaven, born of a woman and the Holy Spirit. Stepped into time. And he did so because he loved to do the will of the Father. He desired to do the will of the Father. He desired to fulfill the commandments of the Father. That's where we fell short. We couldn't complete these things 100%. Jesus fulfilled all the righteousness in the law by not breaking one commandment. Turn into Matthew 5. We'll see here that this righteous Lord, when He came to this earth, and He stepped down from heaven, He stepped down from a place of worship, a place of glory, and stepped into eternity. He fulfilled all of the law. Not just the Ten Commandments, but there were 600 odd commandments throughout the whole law. Jesus fulfilled them 100%. Matthew 5 17 says, Think not that I have come to destroy the law. Because we know the law is perfect, the law is righteous, the law is without blemish. All the prophets 
the words the prophets had, 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 had spoken. I have not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, to heaven and earth pass one yacht or one tittle, shall not and wise pass from the law to all be fulfilled. Jesus did not come to this world to just for our righteousness. The only reason why he could be deemed righteous is because he fulfilled every single aspect of the law. He did not break one of those commandments. He was 100% holy, 100% righteous. And because he loved the Father so much, the law was within his heart and he broke nothing. Not only did he step down from heaven, descended and was obedient to his Father, not only did he fulfill the commandments, but also Jesus brought life. Jesus brought life to you and me because of what he had done, because of the sacrifice that he has made, he brought life. Romans 5, 18 and 19 says, Therefore, as by the offence of one, judgment came unto all men. By Adam's offence, by what he did in breaking the law of, um, of God, all men, he brought upon all men condemnation. Because all men have sinned. Not because of just what Adam did, because we are descendants of him and we have all sinned. Even so, by the righteousness of one, the free gift came, came upon all men unto justification of life. So just as Adam... In Adam, we all die. As descendants of Adam, we're all descendants of Adam, every single one of us. Um, if you marry a woman, you marry a sister, we're all descendants. And we have all sinned. Because of that, we have all under the condemnation. But because of the free gift of Jesus Christ, we have all at life. Verse 19 says, For as by one man's disobedience, Adam's, many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one, many were made righteous. Because of Jesus' obedience, by fulfilling the law 100% accurately, we have that righteousness. We can be named righteousness. Not because of what we've done, but because we believed in what Jesus has done. He is the Son of God. 1 Peter 3.18 says, For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. What an amazing God we have. That Jesus would step into time and eternity, to fulfill the commands, not for himself, but for us. But one thing that we that's not often preached, uh, we know that Jesus descended, we know that Jesus died, we know that Jesus rose again, but a lot of times people don't so much speak that Jesus obviously ascended. Now he ascended to the right hand of all power. John 20, 17 says, Jesus says unto her, this is after his death, but even before his death, he was proclaiming to his disciples that he was not going to be on the earth for long. That he was going to ascend to the right hand of all power and of all majesty. And this was contrary to what a lot of people believed. Because they believed that when Jesus came, he was going to be setting up his kingdom and the kingdom was going to be a physical kingdom. But Jesus was saying, towards the end of his ministry, when he's coming towards his death, that he will be going back to the Father and that he will be ascending. And one of the first people that he told was, was Mary. And Jesus said unto Mary in John chapter 20, verse 17, Touch me not, for I am not yet ascended to my Father. But go to my brethren and say unto them, I ascend unto my Father and your Father, and to my God and to your God. So Jesus is telling Mary, Go forth and tell everybody that I have risen, but also that I am going to ascend. Luke 24, if you'd like to turn there with me. Um... One of the times when, when Jesus was, was speaking to his disciples, he was obviously giving this, this, uh, this teaching to his disciples about how he, how he will ascend back up to the Father. And in Luke 24 he says, And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you. This is the Holy Spirit, the Comforter that we've been talking about. Uh, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until ye be endued with power from on high. And he led them out as far as Bethany, and he lifted up his hands and blessed them. And it came to pass... While he blessed them, he was carried up into heaven. So he which came down to the earth, sacrificed himself, fulfilled the law 100%, um, was carried back up to the place where he came from. And it's because of his sacrifice, because of this, that we now have this righteousness. We can be forgiven by our, um, our Father of the commandments that we have broken if we believe that Jesus is the Christ, if we repent of those sins that we've, we've committed, we've broken, and if we 
believe, uh, if we are, we are baptised. So what can we learn this morning about righteousness? What is righteousness? Well, remember that we, we, we had those different words. That we, we, you know, there's fair and equitable. You know, we, we, um, we can be righteous. People ourselves can be righteous because we can do righteous things. But all our righteousness is as filthy rags compared to, to Jesus, really. Um, all our righteousness is as filthy rags. And remember Ecclesiastes 7.20, There is not a righteous man on earth that continually does good and who never sins. We have all sinned and fallen short. Can righteousness of the law redeem us? Well, the law itself is perfect. The law is good. But we could never fulfill the law. Only Jesus could do that. Only Jesus could fulfill that law 100%. And we see that in the righteousness of Christ Jesus. I want to finish this morning with a scripture in Matthew 28. Um, all that he has done, done, Jesus Christ, was for us, for our redemption. So that we could be redeemed back to the Father. Because we lost that in Adam. We lost that communion so much with God. We've got we've claimed it back now for Christ Jesus. I want us to finish in Matthew 28. After Jesus' death, and when he was obviously coming in amongst them, and before his ascension, he actually said this. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All power in heaven and earth. So he has all power. Go ye therefore and teach all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all the things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. All power is Jesus Christ. He's given us the same commandment as He's given His disciples. Go into the world, preach this, preach this gospel, teach these commands. Teach people that they have sinned and fallen short of the commandment. Because unless people actually know that they need a Saviour, how can they accept the Saviour? We need to preach to people the righteousness of God, the law. And if people understand the law, they understand that they are guilty, they have broken this law. The only way that they can be righteous is through Jesus Christ. The only way. And He has all power, He has all majesty. If you're listening to this this morning, and you're like, wow, um... I've committed sin. I've broken the law. And I am in desperate need of a saviour. What do I need to do to be saved? Well, you need to believe. You need to believe what we've just spoken about. You need to believe that you are a sinner. That you have broken God's commands. And you are in need of a saviour. Every single one of us has done it. You need to believe that Jesus Christ is the only way to the Father. The only righteous person to have ever lived and been sacrificed on the cross died, resurrected, and ascended. We need to believe that He has done this for you. You need to repent. You need to turn away from those things that are so easy to beset you. Those sins that are so easy to beset you. Those temptations. Because we are only tempted when we're tempted away by our own lust and entice. We need to turn away from those things and turn into the righteous things. Do righteous works. And we need to be washed clean in the waters of baptism. Not sprinkled, washed, immersed in the waters of baptism. And you can be saved. And you need to make sure that you are continuing in these things. Continuing in these works of righteousness. Continuing in the, um, the Apostles' Doctrine. It can be a hard message sometimes. We have all sinned. We have all fallen short. But we've been made righteous in Christ Jesus. Continue in these things, brothers and sisters. I implore you. Let us now ask Alan Ford to bring the last song. Oh, finish the breath.